Our special guest is a global keynote speaker, Hollywood filmmaker, producer at Disney DreamWorks. There you go. That it's 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 done. Finish. No more. <laughs> We're done, man. We're done. <laughs> He's a podcaster. He's a podcaster. He's also the host of Life of Awesome. Guys, check it out. Um, I will talk about that more later. But let's all welcome our special, special guest in the Creative Talk podcast. Let's all welcome Saul Blinkoff. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much. It is so good to be with you. And I don't know about celebrity. I think maybe that's a little too far. I'm not Tom Cruise, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm not Justin Bieber, but I do appreciate the fact that I've had the opportunity to work on projects that have helped mold your childhood and others. And I take that uh, responsibility as a, as a big honor, and I appreciated it. And I appreciate being here with you today. So excited to meet you. This is, yeah. uh, we guys, for everyone that is listening and watching, it's been, you know, a long process just to get this episode done. I've been back reading all the message. We were, we were cooking this episode since uh, last year of That's right. yeah, February, yeah. March. And this guy, the reason why I call him a celebrity, because he's always on the go. And, you know, <laughs> guys, <true. laughs> ch check his website. If you're going to be surprised of all the projects that he made. That's the reason why I said that his works are the foundation of not only kids, but people, majority of, you know, of, of the people in this generation. He is a key essential in their personality. So, uh, okay, I'm going to go straight forward. So um, let's start with who or what influenced you to be in this position you are right now. You know, your, your, life story, a, a brief overview of your journey. The floor is yours, my friend. Ah, thank you, my friend. Um, well, Jan, right? Did I pronounce that right, Jan? It's funny. People in the people in Europe calls me Jan. People uh -huh. in the US calls me Jan. And people in the Philippines call me a different name. So let's uh -oh. go with Jan. <laughs> what, 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 do, what do people call you that, that you prefer? Let's, let's do John. Yeah, John. John? Yeah, John. I like January, that. Jan. Yeah. Jan. Jan. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do that. So Jan, um, yeah, you know what? You're right. I'm I've made my filmmaking my my life career as a filmmaker, as a storyteller. Um, but maybe for a moment I'll share some of my own personal story with your audience. And I just want to urge everyone listening, you know, if you hear anything in this episode, or any episode for that matter, or any podcast or TED Talk or whatever you're listening to. If there's something that speaks to you, you need to write it down because so often in life we will hear wisdom or we'll hear ideas and we'll be inspired. And then the next day we'll be like, wait, what did that person say? You know, it's one thing to, to be inspired. It's another to live inspired. In order to live inspired, we need to turn that wisdom we hear into a tool to actually apply to our lives. So let me share with you a little bit of my own story. And if you hear anything along the way, I urge you, please write it down. That's the reason why I have this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, we're going to pause for a second. You're going to edit. I got to blow my nose, okay? So you tell whoever's editing this, I'm going to hit mute right now. I'm going to save everybody a lot of aggravation. Hold on. <laughs> Happy for the new button. <laughs> Ready? See, that's what you get at 6 a.m. That's the 6 a.m. <laughs> saw. You get nose saw. Yeah. All Let's right, pick up on yep. oh, I know five, that. four, three, two, pick up. So, Saul, um, who and what influenced you to be in this position you are right now? You know, your, your life story, man. Um, yeah. Give us an overview, yeah. a, a, a brief journey. The floor is yours. Of course. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, look, you know, my story, uh, it really starts when I was about, uh, you know, six, seven years old. I used to love to do 
what all kids love to do. I used to draw all the time. I used to draw on everything. I actually used to draw on the walls with my mother's lipstick. Anyone listening, do not try that at home. <laughs> I mean, I drew anywhere I could. And then I was 11 years old and I went to the movies and I saw the movie E.T. That was it. I saw that movie. And I'm like, wow, that's that's there's something magic about that. I remember tapping my mom at the end of the movie. And I'm like, mom, that's what I want to do someday. My mom was like, what? You want to leave planet Earth in a spaceship? I'm like, no, mom, I want to make movies. You know, guys, I grew up in New York. All right. I, I didn't grow up in Hollywood. I didn't know. I didn't even know that you could be a movie maker, or a director, or anything. I didn't know that there was a creative job opportunity. People I knew were business people and lawyers and teachers and doctors. I didn't know you could make movies. But at the end of that movie, something pulled me. And I went to the library the next day. Some of you listening have no idea what that is. It's before Google. It was, it was a building. I was about to say that. I was about I to say that, guys. <laughs> guys, for all the listeners and viewers, library is a, a place where you can find treasures. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. So I go to the library, uh, Jan, and I get books on filmmaking, cameras, lenses, storyboarding. I find out the director of E.T. was a guy that every weekend would make movies with kids in the neighborhood. So I went and got a film camera and I got kids in the neighborhood. I got my twin sister, my older brother. And every weekend I was making a movie. I'd make murder movies, monster movies. I remember one time we tied my sister, my twin sister up to a tree to make this kidnap movie. Afterwards, we go into the house to watch the movie. I still remember my mom going, I like the movie, but where's your sister? I said, well, she's still tied to the tree. What's wrong? <laughs> so I knew I was going to be a filmmaker. And then I get to high school. Uh, some people call it secondary school. And when I was in high school, uh, somebody came up to me and said, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? I said, well, I want to be a filmmaker. They said, no, you don't, because if you want to be a filmmaker, you're going to have to move out to Hollywood. And Hollywood is filled with weirdos. <laughs> they looked at me and said, you don't want to end up a weirdo, do you? And right then and there, I gave up on wanting to be a filmmaker because I don't want to end up a strange weirdo. And it's amazing when I when I share that thinking right now, how often in life somebody could say something and change the trajectory of our goals or, or influencing us to make us think that we can't achieve something or even do something. And I was influenced. So I gave up on that. My parents said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll go back to being an artist, just drawing. So my incredibly supportive parents got me an art teacher to come to my house. And I, this teacher taught me to draw from life. She'd set up a bowl of fruit and she'd say, Saul, drawing is about seeing. Develop your eye. Develop your eye to look at the world a different way. That's what it means to be an artist. It's not that you're copying from life. You're seeing life through a certain lens and then you're representing it through your lens. And she taught me to draw a pencil and pastel and oil painting and watercolor. I was terrible at drawing hands, by the way. Any artist listening, you know that hands are difficult to draw. I agree. And my art I teacher, agree. Yeah, I right? I fine arts major in advertising, so I understand what you're telling. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> and my art teacher says to me, oh, if you're bad at drawing hands, draw a hand every night from a different position before you go to bed. And you know what will happen? You'll get good at drawing hands. She taught me one of the first great lessons of my life. Find your weakness and turn it into your strength. Incredible. So I drew hands every night from a different position. I became good at drawing hands. I remember I went to the movies again. It was my junior year of high school, secondary school. And I saw the movie, The Little Mermaid. I'm watching the screen and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. An animation combine my two passions, my love of drawing, my love of filmmaking, put it together, animation. And plus, I found out that Disney had a studio in Orlando, Florida. I don't have to go out to LA. I remember and the credits were rolling in the movie. I tapped my mom. I'm like, mom, that's what I want to do someday. She's like, what, you want to fall in love with a fish? I'm like, no, mom, I'm going to be a Disney animator. So I had my goal. But I just had no idea how to do it. Today, you want to be a Disney animator, you go to Google. You type in, how do you become a Disney animator? Well, there was no Google then. I didn't have that. I had no way to figure out how. But you know what I did have? The most supportive mom in history. My mom took me, not my sister, not my older brother, took me to Disney World, walking me around Disney World. I remember we were uh, 
getting on the It's a Small World boat ride. And the lady at Disney, the cast member, the employee, they're called cast members at Disney. She says, well, how many in your party were stepping on the boat? And we're like, two. She goes, okay, this way. We're getting on. My mom's like, by the way, my son wants to be a Disney animator. Can you help? It was very embarrassing, actually. <laughs> you know, a, a beautiful uh, mom that makes you feel, you know, you. she lives for you, but it can be very embarrassing. So we're getting on, and, and the lady at Disney's like, man, this is a boat ride. We don't hire Disney animators here. But if you want to get your son to Disney, you got to take him to the Disney casting building. It was four minutes away from where we were in Disney World. And can you imagine what a Disney office building looks like? It was beautiful. So we drive there four minutes away from Disney World where we were. And I get to this building, and uh, the doorknobs look like the ones from Alice in Wonderland. Do you remember those, Jan? The ones that talk? They were made out of brass. I open up the doors. I walk into this atrium, gold statuette of Mickey, Donald, Pluto, Goofy. Even the air in this atrium was like like pixie dust. It smelled like Disney air. It was like, wow, magic. Painted on the ceiling was Peter Pan and Wendy. I walk up this ramp. Finally, it's my turn for the interview. I sit there and the woman at Disney goes, what would you, what would you like? And I go, well, my dream is to be a Disney animator. She says, well, we don't hire those here. We hire people that work the rides, people that make Dumbo go up and down. I'm like, well, that's not really my dream. She goes, well, hold on a second. She walks out of the room, comes in two minutes later and hands me a piece of paper. That piece of paper became the most valuable piece of paper I ever held in my hands. What's that? What, what, what's the paper? It was a list of eight schools, eight art universities that Disney recruits their artists from. She mm. says, if you want to be a Disney animator, you need to go to one of these schools. Well, that was it. In my head, that was the equation. That was the recipe for how to achieve my goal. So often I meet people and I ask them, what's your goal? And how are you going to achieve it? Sometimes people don't know. If you don't know how to achieve it, it's not going to happen. I saw it as an equation. Saul plus go to one of these schools will equal dream of being a Disney animator. So there it was. Wow. I had my dream and I knew now how to achieve it. I love that. I love that. Achieving the dream. In, in, let's put it in a, a different perspective. Um, in my experience, you know, people around me, um, they, they were what I call naysayers because I choose to be, you know, I'm an artist more than a designer. And that's the reason why I took fine arts. And there are people around that they say, hey, don't take that. There's no money in that. You know, choose other career, choose this, choose that. You're going to earn, you're going to build an empire. Did that ever happen in your journey? So I mean, you know, yeah, it's, that's great. I'm happy you say that because that is a very common thing. When people pick creative livelihoods, right? quite often their parents are the ones who are not supporting them because they don't think there's a lot of money in it. That's exactly what you said. Um, look, you know, Jen, I was lucky that my parents never made me feel that way. They always made me feel that if this is what you love, if this is what makes you happy, if this is what lights you up, you got to go for it. However, you better put in 100%. You better put in discipline. You better put in discipline and take this responsibility. I remember the first day of art school, my art teacher, he says to us in the room, how many of you doodled in your science textbooks when you were in high school? And everyone's hand went up, right? You, you too, right? We all doodled. He goes, well, for the rest of your life, now those doodles that you did, you better take it seriously because they're going to pay for you to eat. They're going to pay for your families to eat for your car, for your gas, for your home, for your lights, for your electric bills. Now it's a job. It's not just something you do that makes you happy and that you have fun doing. You better take it seriously. And, you know, I've had many times I've traveled, Jen, and I've had parents come up to me and say, what can I do to encourage my child who wants to go into art and all that? And I say, just encourage them to draw encourage them to create, encourage them to write, whatever that instinct is that they have of creativity, just nurture it. And sometimes I'll meet university students and I'll say, well, where do you, they'll be my dream. 
my dream is to be a filmmaker or my dream is to be an artist. I want to make my living as an artist. And I'll be like, where do you go to school? And they'll tell me the name of some liberal arts university, you know, Michigan University, Boston University. And I'm like, but I thought you said your dream was to be an artist. I'm like, yeah, I take the art program there. And I said, well, why not go to an art school? Why not go to a film school? Don't you think that would be the place where you would get a better education? And they're like, yeah, but, you know, I need something to fall back on. You know, if I don't, and I'm like, oh, you know what you just told yourself? You don't believe in yourself. You just told yourself you're not going to make it. <laughs> That's what you just told yourself, right? If you want to be great at something, mm -hmm. then you want to surround yourself with the greatest people in that. You know, I remember going to, after I had that list of art schools for my mom, Jan, from, the, from Disney, my mom and I went to all these different art schools to see which would be a good fit. And I get to one school in Columbus, Ohio. It's called the Columbus College of Art and Design. And I remember walking the halls of that school and seeing the artwork on the walls. And the guy touring me around was taking me one wall to another. And I see this artwork and it's amazing. A hundred times better than anything I could ever do. Amazing. And I see and this art, it's incredible. And, I, and, the, and the guy touring me around, I say to him, you know, your seniors are so talented. He goes, Saul, every piece of artwork you see on the walls here was done by our freshman class. I'm like, what? They were a year older than me and they were a hundred times better than me. I felt intimidated. Why would I want to go to a, a school where I would have been the worst one? I'm telling you guys, anyone listening, if I chose that school, I would have been the worst artist at that school. But you know why I chose that school? Because if we surround ourselves with people that are better than us, that will nurture us to grow. If you want to be great at something, surround yourself with people who are better than you and you will grow. Boom. Boom. Write that down. Love that. Love that. <laughs> love that. And I totally agree. First, because you mentioned, you know, a part of your story is your mother, your mom. Same with me, man. Same with me. I remember right? there, 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 was a, there was a moment in, in our life that, I, that we were in a store, a toy shop. And then I was asking for a Batman toy, Batman action figure. And then my mom said, Sorry. okay, we're going we're gonna to get that for you, but we need to chop Batman into three, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I was <laughs> like, okay, get the, got the point. So wow. but then, you know, that's, that's, that's where our situation before. But then when, when I told my mom that I want to, you know, pursue fine arts and it's a very costly course. You know, you need to get all the materials and everything. Oh, and yeah. You never said no. So I, I feel your story and there's a lot of memories there. And when you mention about, okay, I'll support whatever you like, but you need to put in the hard work, the discipline. This is not a game anymore. And I totally agree. And, you know, there were times that I can't drew uh, you know what the professor is asking because you have your limitations man that was like battlefield of the mind how would you yeah. overcome this and I also love when you said that if you you know you want to be great you want to really improve surround yourself with you know powerful and great people and and that's you know that's something that remind me of my journey until now that's the reason why you're here in the show <laughs> that's awesome and you know it can also be very intimidating i mean i want to tell you guys i remember the first week in art school um i i was i was surrounded by artists that were better than me and like i said in a week into school a disney representative came from disney animation to our school and this guy gets up on a stage and in the auditorium, every freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. You had 750 students in that auditorium that day. And he gets up on stage. He was one of the original animators on Sleeping Beauty. He used to hang out with Walt Disney. I mean, I was intimidated. And he looks out to the audience and he says, how many of you want to be Disney animators? And every hand went up. He said, just so you know, out of the 750 of you, maybe just maybe four of you will ever work there. That's how competitive it is. Ooh. And when he said that, I remember thinking one thing, I wonder who the other three are going to be. I love that. Man. Because in life, we either believe in ourselves that we can accomplish or we don't. I don't Ooh. mean what we tell people on Facebook and Instagram, what we talk to our friends about. I mean, deep down, do we really believe 
that we can accomplish. And at that point in my life, I believe, then he said, if you want to get into Disney animation, no cartoon characters. We don't want to see any drawings of Mickey Mouse. He says, you got to get the internship. And in order to get the Disney internship, you need a portfolio, 25 pages filled with life drawing of people and animals, figure drawing and animals all drawn from life. Boom. That was it. That was the answer key. What I needed to know of how to get into Disney. That recipe I spoke about was growing, right? So I went to figure drawing classes and that's when I met this guy, Andy. Andy was the best artist in the school as a freshman because the guy never stopped drawing and he became my best friend. And I will tell you all just being friends with someone like that made me a better artist. Wow. Yeah, Yeah. Because, you know, who we choose to be friends with actually affects who we become. Boom. That, that's that's a mark there. That's a cue there for a powerful single content. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And let me tell you that first month, couple months in school, my drawings just got better. And it's not that I just got to be a better artist. It was all about the mind. My work ethic improved. The way I, I put integrity and discipline into my work is Andy showed me that. I remember other students being lazy and blowing off their work smoking pot all the time, not taking it seriously. Andy was serious and he made me more serious. It was awesome. After a couple of months, actually it was my sophomore year, I got my drawings together. I put them in a portfolio and I thought that I would try to get into Disney as a sophomore. Now look, Jan, I didn't expect to get in as a sophomore, but I wanted to go through the process. So I send the portfolio in a couple months later, I get a letter on Disney stationery. It's got my name typed on there. It's got a gold leaf Mickey and printed in the envelope. Wow. I remember being excited that the Disney company knew I was alive. They had my name printed on an envelope. It was awesome. And unfortunately, in the letter, it said you did not get it. What? You You did not get in? Yeah, I got rejected. And, you know, look, like I said, I was I wasn't expecting to get in the first time. I just wanted to go through that process. I took that letter. Were you sad? I was a little bum. Yeah, I put that letter up over my wall. Like I said, I knew the Disney company knew I was alive. I put that letter, that rejection letter up over my desk. People came in. They're like, wow, blink off. Disney knows you're alive. I I remember thinking that was pretty cool. And another whole year goes by. And Andy and I are drawing constantly. And not just for class. I mean, we would Mm -hmm. walk around Ohio at night and draw street lights and people Mm -hmm. at cafes, just drawing constantly. I remember one day. Um, our one of our teachers had a great idea to take us to the zoo to Mm. go draw animals now when you guys listening when you watch a disney movie like lion king how do you think disney animators know how to draw animals you think you just wake up every day and you can tell no how to draw anything an elephant no you have to go to the zoo and study the anatomy of that animal you open up anatomy books and you learn the anatomy we have anatomy class in in fine arts yeah. There you go. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So we go to the zoo one day. There's got to be like, you know, 10 or 12 students. We take the bus to the zoo and it was a freezing cold day, freezing day. And we get to the zoo. And as soon as we get there, we all get off the bus. We walk into the little cafe at the zoo. I think it was a Wendy's. And we go into that Wendy's and I'm getting like a hot coffee. People are getting hot tea, hot chocolate because it's mm-hmm. freezing out there, bitter cold. After about a couple minutes, Andy and I leave the Wendy's and we go and we find we're walking in the zoo and we find this elephant and this elephant is just walking back and forth, like repeating the same motion, which for an artist is like the greatest gift you could find because first of all, you're studying animation. It's the right. repetition of movement mm. and to see an elephant walk back and forth and do the exact same motion over and over again, then we get to draw every one of those poses. It was awesome. And we stayed right there for an hour freezing drawing that elephant that day and i remember noticing like where's the rest of the students like if they're not drawing this elephant like what animal are they at are they the monkeys like where are they finally we realized oh we got to go we get back on the bus and andy and i show each other each other's drawing like hey man look let me see your drawing he shows me mine and it's like awesome and then i go to the other students where were you guys Mm. we never saw you at the elephants this one guy looks to me and goes, we never made it out of the Wendy's. Ooh. 
I'm like, what do you okay. mean you never made it out? He's like, yeah, we couldn't leave. None of us could. I'm like, what do you mean? They locked you in there? He goes, no, 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 we couldn't leave because it was too cold out there. And I go, oh, it was too cold. At that moment, Jen, I got the confidence, the boost I needed. I realized at that moment that every one of those students would never get into Disney because it was easy to put on a Mickey Mouse sweatshirt. Right. It was easy to, to buy a Disney DVD or Disney, well, I don't know DVDs then, a Disney <laughs> VHS tape. VHS. <laughs> right. But when it comes down to it, are you going to do the work? Mm. You know, anyone listening, if you watch a documentary on Netflix or Hulu about somebody great who's accomplished anything great, you know, the common denominator is, you know what they all have in common? They've put in an insane amount of hard work, even when they're freezing, even when it's difficult. You know, Michael Jordan was my hero growing up. Mm. If you haven't watched The Last Dance, it's mm. a great documentary about him. Man. You find out about this one game. I think it was Portland. Mm. It was like a playoff game. And he got food poisoning because some guys yeah. delivered him a pizza. We don't know mm. what they did to that pizza, but yeah, he gets food poisoning. I mean, if you've ever had food poisoning, you know how painful that is. Michael Jordan didn't wake up and go, you know what? I got food poisoning. Hopefully you all understand. I got to sit this one out. Yeah. His attitude was, if I'm alive, I will go onto that court and I will give 100%, period. Mm. Was it freezing for me and Andy that day? Yeah, it was freezing. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? It's painful. Yeah. You push through the pain. You get out of your comfort zone and you can accomplish Boom. Yeah. Love that. Guys, these are power knowledge bombs. Wow. I love that. I love that. So with that, you know, I'm, I'm so pumped up. I'm so in inspired. I, there, there's so much learning from, from your story. Um, I'm going to pause a bit from that and I'm going to connect it to the present. You know, all those experiences, both your journey um, before, now that you're a professional, Let's talk about, you know, important life lessons from Disney films, because yeah. clearly, clearly there's a lot of values in your journey. And I love that. Now that you're a professional, there's a lot of, you know, it's a whole new world because you, 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 a ventured. Whole new world. <laughs> see, see, I use that. I, I was thinking, where can I use that? <laughs> no, I love um, it. Getting aside, man, now that you've seen, you know, a different perspective as a professional in a very large company, man, it's, it's an empire. Yeah. What can you share, you know, tips, important life lessons from Disney films? The floor is yours. Wow. wow. That's like my favorite question ever. I mean, what a great, and it's so great that you, you know, a lot of people don't think that they go to the movies to learn. They think they go to the movies just to enjoy and be entertained. But what gives these movies so much uh, life is that they offer us wisdom. They offer us, like you said, Jan, perfectly, life lessons. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you the, the biggest life lesson that I ever learned from a Disney movie. Um, you know, when I got, re well, when Andy and I sent our portfolios in with all those zoo drawings, what I didn't tell you is uh, a month later, Andy got into Disney and I got rejected again. I was about to ask you that. Like what yeah. happened to Andy? I thought you, the both of you were approved. You, 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 no. got, you both got in. No, see, he got in on his first try. It was my second try and I didn't get in. What? You were rejected it, twice. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it was, uh, it was one of the most bittersweet days of my life. I was happy for my best friend but bitter because my dream was shattered. Andy's going off to Disney World. They call Disney World the happiest place on mm. earth, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, he's going to sunny, beautiful Orlando. I'm going back to Ohio in the <laughs> winter time. Bitter, cold, gray skies. I thought it was the most depressing place right. on earth. And when I get back to school, people come up to me and they're like, Blinkoff, what are you doing here? What, where's Andy? Oh, he got it. You didn't. Oh. I felt that's like a painful, loser. right? That's painful. Oh, it was Whenever painful. someone's going to ask you, hey, what, what happened? Did you oh, get yeah. in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I became known as the guy that was friends with the guy that got into Disney. That was it. And I felt like a loser. 
And um, then I came up with a brilliant way to take that feeling of being a loser away. And anyone listening, if you ever have something in your life where you struggle and you fail and you want to take that feeling away, you do what I did and that feeling goes away. You know what I did? I gave up. I gave up on the entire dream because reality said it. Reality was Andy was an awesome artist. He was a natural. He was talented. And I was just someone that worked hard that just wasn't good enough. Who was I to think that I could be great? Who was I to think that I could work at Disney one day? You know, each one of us has a shoulder devil and a shoulder angel. I directed a film, Kronk's New Groove, the sequel to Emperor's New Groove. And in that movie, we have a character, Kronk. Yeah, Kronk, uh, that guy. And he has an angel and a devil, always telling him what to do, battling, just like we do. We have that devil telling us we can. Who do you think you are to accomplish, to want something? Then we have that angel telling us we want to aspire to reach great heights. That's the battle we will always have. Well, I give up on the dream completely. A week later, a buddy calls me and says, Saul, I got tickets to go see a movie. You want to go? And I go, I'm not in the mood. He goes, yeah, but they're free. I'm like, okay, I'll go. You know, someone offers you free in college, you take it. Yeah. <laughs> so I go to the movies and I see a movie. It's a true story about a guy who's five feet tall. He doesn't have an ounce of athletic ability and he wants to play football at Notre Dame. John, do you know what movie that was? No, this don't. is all, this is the nineties. Now we're going to go back. Not an animated movie. The movie is called Rudy. Mm. And Rudy is a true story about this kid that dreams of playing football at Notre Dame, but he's not tall. He's not athletic. And if you were friends with Rudy Rudiger and he told you his dream was to play football at Notre Dame, you know what you would have told him as his friend, dude, I love you. Get a new dream. And Rudy is like, oh, yeah, well, we'll just see about that. And he tries to get in rejected second time rejected third year rejected. But fourth year, you know, if you look at the movie poster for the movie, Rudy, it says when people tell you dreams don't come true, tell them about Rudy. He gets in. And I'm telling you all, tears are streaming down my face when I watched that movie the first time. And I remember leaving that theater thinking, wow, if an unathletic kid could get into Notre Dame with an insane amount of hard work, then me, what I thought was an untalented artist, could get into Disney with an insane amount of hard work. And I vowed never to give up again. As a matter of fact, I called the head of Disney the next day. And I asked him, how come I didn't get in? And he told me. Really? He, you did that? Yeah. I called wow. him up. I know. Who does that, right? I did that. And he, and he goes, you need more perspective in your drawing. Okay. You stand, stand up on a stool and draw looking down at something. Ah, I, remember yeah, going to, yeah. I remember going to the zoo and drawing giraffes this time from above. I got on the scaffold they had when they were feeding the giraffes. Oh, so cool. Okay. And then I asked him this question at Disney. How close was I to getting in? He said, Saul, we picked it. 15 from thousands around the world and you made it to number 20. I had only missed it by five. Do you know how close I was? Do you know how many times in our lives we could be so close to achieving something we feel like we're miles or kilometers away and all we needed to do was push a little bit more? And then I got my drawings together and did new drawings. And eventually I did get in to Disney. I got the internship on my third time and started working on the film Pocahontas, which was the first movie I've and if you've ever listened and if you've ever heard of Pocahontas, this is BF before oh, yeah. Frozen. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And this is the point I want to say. I'm going to go back to your question about what wisdom can we learn from mm. films and Disney films in particular that we can apply to our lives. Mm. Well, you know, that second time when I got rejected, I remember being on the phone one night with my twin sister. And she was trying to encourage me. And I remember saying to her, Rena, her name is Rena. I said, Rena, if I could get into Disney and sit at an, a desk and just draw Mickey Mouse all day, I would be happy. I mean, how many of us, how many of us wake up every day with a goal to be happy? I think if you ask most people in the world, most people have the goal. 99% of the world has the goal. You know what I want out of my day? I want to be happy. 
You know what kind of life I want? I want to be happy. You know, I'm choosing a creative field or going to be a musician or opening up a bake sale or a cookie company because it makes me happy. Well, I remember watching the movie, The Lion King. And if you remember in that movie, Simba, he wants to be king. He sings a song about it. Just can't wait to be king, right? You remember? And he thinks being a king is he can do whatever he wants. And Mufasa, his father, says to him again, Simba, there's more to being a king, getting your way all the time. Simba's like, there's more? He thinks being a king is I can do whatever I want. Unlimited yeah, power. Yeah. Mm. And something happens to his father. I don't know if I should ruin it for everybody. It's been over <laughs> 35 years. If you're alive on planet Earth, hopefully you know what's happened. And if you haven't seen it, if I'm about to spoil it, you deserve to have it spoiled. Daddy dies. Look, it's a Disney movie. They always kill off a parent, right? No. Isn't that no, right? <laughs> That's right. And dad dies. Simba goes off to Hakuna Matata world. Yeah. And, my what, and what is Hakuna characters. Matata? Right. Timon Pumbaa. and Pumbaa. <laughs> Timon and Pumbaa. Weren't they great? Oh, I love them, man. They I were great. Yeah. And what does Hakuna Matata mean? It means no worries. It means no responsibility. Mm. Well, he goes off there. He grows up over there. He gets older anyway. And midway through the movie, Jan, let's test you on Disney trivia. Who oh, shows man. up? Who shows up? To uh, wait, see wait, wait. Um, Nala? There you go. There you Boom. go. Yeah. Nala shows up, but she's grown up now, isn't yeah, she? Yeah. Right? So they have their song. Can you feel the love tonight? Mm -hmm. They're rolling around in the sunset. They're about to kiss. <laughs> Remember that scene? It's a little strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always hide my kids' eyes when they watch that when they were little. <laughs> That's not a pro, but you should not watch Lions Kissing. I love Lion King so much. J just a segue. I love Lion King so much. My wife loves Lion King so much also. If we were given a daughter, her name would be Nala. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's awesome. So You're that's the real deal. how. That's how. It right. Okay. So that's my movie, too, brother. That's my go to. Now, check this out. He's off in Hakuna Matata world. Nala shows up. After they have their love song, they start to talk. And she says, Simba. You got to come back with me. He's like, what do you mean? She's like, well, Scar's taking over everything. He's like, no, no, no. Hakuna Matata. I'm staying here. She's like, maybe I didn't make myself clear. Scar's taking over everything. And if you don't come back, everyone's going to die. And you are responsible. And then you know what he says? Hakuna Matata. I'm staying right here. And she's like, what do you mean? And she even sings, why won't he be the king I know he is? The king I see inside. She sees his greatness. He doesn't see it in himself. And you know what she does? She leaves him. After she fights with him, she's like, I can't believe you're going to. He's like, well, you're beginning to sound like my dad. She goes, at least one of us does. Mm -hmm. She leaves him. Because she sees his greatness and he doesn't. She's like, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to be a man, a, a lion? You know what I mean? She leaves him. He's left alone. Rafiki shows up, brings him to the reflection, sees his father's reflection. Remember who you are. <laughs> and Simba goes back, defeats Scar, and Lion King becomes the biggest animated movie of all time, BF, before Frozen. Mm, yeah. And it didn't become such a great movie because we just love movies about animals, because we love movies about lions. You know why it became such a phenomenal movie? Because at the end, when he climbs that rock and that music is playing and the rain is going goosebumps. away. Goosebumps. Because we're seeing a vision of what greatness is. Greatness is not waking up every day and saying, what will I do to make me happy? See, when I didn't get into Disney my second time and I said to my sister, Rena, all I want to do is sit at a desk and draw Mickey Mouse all day. All I want to do, that will make me happy. You know, if I could go in a time machine with Doc Brown back to myself at that time in my life, you know what I would tell myself? What? Saul, grow up. Ooh. You think life is about waking up every day and wanting to make yourself happy? No, there's something so much sweeter than going for a life of happiness. It's going for a life of meaning, a meaningful life, because what makes you happy may not be what's good for you. And how do you get a life of meaning? Lion King teaches us one way, responsibility. Mm. Look at our lives and realize that greatness is taking responsibility 
for the world? And where do we take responsibility? Wherever in our lives we have the ability to respond. The responsibility is wherever we have the ability to respond. If you wake up and you're listening to this podcast and you have artistic talent, you weren't given that talent from the creator so you could sit and draw and make yourself happy. You're given that talent so you can make the world more colorful, other people happy, give other people a sense of hope in their day, in their, in their life. You listen to music. It can, music saves people's lives. You put on the right music, it can change a person's mindset. You're changing the world. And where do you take responsibility? Any moment in the day, someone's walking by you and you smile at them. You just cheered them up. You just changed the world. If you're listening to this and you're a teacher, you're changing the world. If you go to work every day at a job that you hate, but you're making money and providing for your family, you're changing the world. That's what means a life of meaning, to take responsibility from the world. That's why Lion King is so powerful. There's your life. life I love that. I love that. But, 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 so wait, wait, I'm going to throw in another, not a question, but another request. Connected still, you know, important life lessons from Disney film. And I cannot forget this because although I love Lion King, my ultimate Disney movie for me is Aladdin. Can you, you know, can you share us some powerful wisdom like what you did in Lion King, but from Aladdin? Oh man, you're just and, you're giving me the great. Per, that's a personal request, man. I love uh, Aladdin. <laughs> first of all, I just saw Aladdin in the theater last week with my kids. Oh yeah, I saw that. You posted uh, an Instagram yeah. post about it. Yeah, that's right. Because we have a theater here. The Disney owns a movie theater called the El Capitan Theater. It's a Disney-owned wow. theater, and all they play is old and new Disney movies. Wow. So all of my kids have grown up seeing Lion King, Pocahontas, Milan, everything. All Lady the Trip. Cinderella, the first yeah. time they saw every one of those was in the theater, which was so Ooh. cool. So Aladdin is, I mean, incredible. And I'm so happy you give me this opportunity to speak about it for a moment. Um, there's really one, there's really one amazing scene I want to highlight in that movie for everybody. You know, if you remember early on in the movie, uh, Aladdin steals one jump ahead. He steals a loaf of bread. One jump ahead of the bread line. Remember? Yes, yes. I'm having goosebumps. I, I, I'm I a fan. Yeah, only I one I can't it. afford. That's everything, right? Mm. So he steals this bread. I mean, he's hungry. He's yeah. homeless. And he's about to eat the bread. And Jen, what happens? What does he do with the bread? He saw um, kids, right? Hungry yep. kids. He breaks the bread, give it to them. Right. And, and how much of the bread does he give the kids? He gave it, he gave everything. And then the, oh, what's, what's the name of the exactly. monkey? Um, Abu. Uh, Abu. Abu. Abu said, you know, if he can, if he can speak, he was like, no. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> what are you doing? What His are you face doing? is so express, expressive. It's like, right. no. <laughs> exactly. Now, you know, what's amazing about that. First of all, he steals a whole loaf of bread. He could have split it with the kids. That would have been fair. I mean, in, in, think about this for a moment. When we give to another person, we, we can share. We don't have to give them all of our money. You know, if you have a candle, if you have a candle and someone else has a candle, but your candle is lit and theirs isn't, all you got to do is take your candle and light theirs. You haven't lost anything and you just changed their life. You gave them fire. You gave them heat. Aladdin doesn't give half the bread. He gives all of it. If you have a candle and someone else doesn't, would you give them the entire thing? It's a difference between giving and giving up. Real giving is I'm going to sacrifice what I want to give someone else what they need. Aladdin teaches us a wonderful lesson. And by the way, when they were making the movie Aladdin, they had trouble with that scene. You'll love this, John, because you why, love why? film. Wow. Because Aladdin wasn't likable. He really? steals the bread. Oh, he yeah. eats the bread. He ate the bread before they wrote that scene with the kids. This is true. And there was a screening and everyone was like, wait a minute. He's a thief. How yeah. can you like this guy? He's, he's literally stealing from another person's business. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the storyboard artists came in and said, you know what? I got an idea. And he pitched it on these big storyboards. This scene where he added these kids eating out of looking for food out of a yeah. trash can. 
Once Aladdin gives up his entire meal to these kids, we love him. We love him. And you can watch in any movie, if you ever see a main character or any character for that matter, be nice to a child, Mm. an old person, or an animal, you will love that character. And if you see someone mean to a child, an old person, or an animal, they'll usually be the villain. Look at the Karate Kid. (laughs) First original movie. Daniel gets to this new place. Yeah. Walks into this apartment. The pool is filled with mud or whatever. Mm. He's upset. And as he's walking up the stairs to get in the very first scene, there's an old person he starts talking to. He's sweet to an old person. Mm. And the old person has a cat next to them. Daniel goes upstairs, doesn't even settled in his new home, comes back down, puts out a little bowl of milk or water for the mm. cat. And there's a film book out there that I want to tell everybody about. If you're a film student or a filmmaker, anything in the creative world, there's a book out there by a dear friend of mine. His name is Blake Snyder. He died many years ago. And the book is called Save the Cat. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing book to understand screenwriting. And how do you, why is it called Save the Cat? Because if you're kind to an animal, Mm. you're going to like the main character, The Incredibles. Mr. Incredible yeah. helps this old lady, uh, yeah. this old tree scene, if you remember, her cat's up in a tree, right? There's wow. a scene where there's that, remember there's that old lady in the Incredibles, remember right. he works in the insurance mm-hmm. and he helps this old, he can't be a superhero, mm-hmm. but man, he can help this little old lady anyway, you can still be a hero, right? So Aladdin teaches us the difference between giving and giving up. And here's the other part I want to share from that movie. Even though Aladdin gives, Aladdin really doesn't believe in himself. You remember just a moment later, you got that rich prince going in to see Jasmine, another suitor for the princess. Prince Ali. (laughs) Right? Oh, before he's Prince Ali. Oh, okay. There's that other guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other prince, right? Another suitor for Mm -hmm. the princess. And he goes in and the guy on this horse is going into the castle to go see Jasmine. Yeah. And he almost steps with his horse on those same kids. Yeah. Aladdin just fed. Yeah. And Aladdin protects the kids. He Mm. saves the cat, saves the kids. And Aladdin says, look, Abu, it isn't every day you see a horse with two rear ends. Yeah. 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 That scene. Yeah. And the guy turns around and he says, you're a street rat. Street rat. Yeah. You're a worthless street rat. You'll, you were born a street rat. You'll, You'll die, die a street, a street rat, rat. And only your fleas will mm. mourn you. Ooh, and man. slams the door. And right after he says that, what does Aladdin say? Do you remember? No. He slams the door. The sun starts to set. And Aladdin says, I'm not worthless. Whoa. And he scratches his head and he says, and I don't have fleas. Man, I'm going to watch the movie again. Now watch this. Jan, you ready? Are you ready <laughs> go, for this? Go, go, You just told the suitor, I'm not worthless and I don't have fleas. If you're not worthless, then why? 15 minutes later in the movie, when you get a genie lamp, are you asking to be more than what you are? Because exactly. you don't believe in mm. yourself. Mm. Now, Aladdin will tell you, oh, you want to know why I'm asking to be a prince? Because there's a rule here. Mm. There's a law. Only a prince can marry a princess. Yeah. So you would be like, okay, I'm sympathetic with you for that. Well, if that was true, then why after a whole new world when they're flying on the curtain and they're sitting on the top of that rooftop and shine and the fireworks are going and Jasmine takes his hat off. She goes, you are the boy from the marketplace. Why did you lie to me? Mm. Did you think I was stupid? You know what she just told him? I knew you weren't a prince and I liked you anyway. Yes. That's the moment where he should have been like, you're right. That's the midpoint of the movie. He should have been like, you know what? You're right. I am just Aladdin. Mm. I am just a poor street rat, Mm. but she liked him anyway. Yeah. He's then he lies to her. That's his big mistake. He goes, you know Ah. what? I'm a prince, but I do kind of sometimes go into the marketplace to escape. Right. 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 right, Yeah. He lies. Why does he lie to her? Because deep down, he doesn't believe in himself. Man. Wow. He is a diamond in the rough, a diamond in the rough, yes. but he doesn't see it himself. And that movie teaches all of us. We need to see our own potential in life. We need to see not who we are, 
We need to see what we can become. And at the end of the day, it's not about cars and money and houses and getting your name in the credits of movies. It's who do I belong? Who do I become along the way? Mm. You know, Jan, to be, you know, kind of serious for a moment, someday I'm going to die. And I have four kids and they're going to see a gravestone and my Mm. name that's been in all those Disney movies is going to be printed in stone for the last time. Do you think my kids are going to sit there and go, wow, he was such a great guy because he worked on all these movies? Hopefully they will say, you know what? My dad tried to become a better dad. Mm-hmm. My, tr- my dad tried to work on his character. At the end of the day, we, it, working on movies and doing all these things is important because we get to put our values into our work. Right. But as I was a filmmaker, did I work with integrity? Did I, te- did I treat my staff and my team with respect? What kind of a character do I become along the way? That's what greatness is. It's are we striving to grow as a human being? Love that. Wow. Guys, for everyone that is watching and listening, those are power bombs, knowledge bombs after knowledge bombs. Wow. Thank you, Saul. Your story full of value. Then we went deep. And we, guys, we just talk about a glimpse of two movies. That's Lion King and Aladdin. And man, if if we could like browse through all those movies, we're going to be so amazed with all the treasures and the values. Wow. I cannot contain myself. So, and I'll come back for part two. We'll rip up Finding Nemo. Mm. My no, son's going to love that. My oh, we got to do I'm going to come back for Finding Nemo, dude. That's all right. All right. For part two. So thank you so much. <laughs> I am personally, I love, I love this episode, not because of Aladdin, but because, you know, we, we, we have common denominators, you know, artist journey uh, from, you know, from A to Z, the, the rejections and everything. So I understand where your story is going. I, I, I know the feeling. Plus, I love the values that you shared for our viewers, for our listeners about, you know, achieving success, doing being disciplined, man. I, I love not everyone is, is prepared to, to embrace that. Everybody wants to be successful, but right. e- not right. everybody wants to really play the game. You know, being disciplined. Everybody wants to change their lives, but they don't want to do the hard work. So yeah. I love that you really share that. Because we need that. Not only them, I need that. We all need that. So thank yeah, by you. By the so way, much. I, I need I need it too, Jan. And you know yeah. that hard work that we put into our careers, we need to put into every aspect of our life. Mm. You know, I put the same effort, I put even more effort that I put into getting into Disney, into trying to become a better husband, a better father, a better human being. You know? Love that, man. Love yeah. that. I love you, man. Definitely there's gonna be part two. <laughs> all right, all right. So Thank you so much. But we're not done yet, all right? We are not done yet. We are in the part of the show that we will play a game. We call this the creative fast talk. How we play this game is I'm going to ask you questions that are random, and you are not allowed to spend time in thinking what the right answer is. First word that comes into your mind, shoot. Are you ready? Oh, boy. Okay, here we go. No, no yeah. right or wrong. Just shoot out the word. Here yes, we go. I'm excited because a creative mind, they are supposed to be used to games like Uh-oh. this. <laughs> no, no, pre- no pressure. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Question number one, sun or snow? Sun. All right. Structure or chaotic? Structure. <laughs> Structure. Love, I'd love, love you to. Money. I'd love you to have my wife here, and she would say, "Oh, my husband's structure." I put the jars back in the pantry, <laughs> and if they're, in, I have labels of the tomato sauce so where it goes. All the labels really? have to be front. Yeah, I'm like, I need structure. Believe it or not. Yeah. Anyway, okay. keep going. I love this game. Let's rock. Okay. 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 So structure or chaotic, you pick structure. All right. Next, love or money. Love. All right. If you were an animal, what animal would you be, and why? Ooh, I uh, can't think about this, can I? Um, probably, uh, probably, uh, uh, <laughs> probably a, probably a, 
I, I, it, it would be a different answer a year and a half ago. But now that we got a dog, a puppy, mm. everything has changed in my life for dogs. I would be a puppy just so I could get all back to the last word, love. Because puppies just get so much love. Puppy love. I love Aww. it. <laughs> very, very well crafted. There you go, guys. That's yeah. that's artist answer. <laughs> there you go. Next, popcorn and movies or dinner and dancing? Uh, how can you even ask that? <laughs> I still have popcorn in my teeth from yesterday <laughs> when we sat and we watched. Uh, what did we watch yesterday? Oh, my gosh. We had the whole family on the couch last night. Oh, we watched uh, Force Awakens. Boom. Mm. Big Star Wars. Oh, fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Since you mentioned family movie movies, night. Yeah. Since you mentioned movies, I'm going to skip the next question, but focus on movies. Name your top five movies of all time. Oh, like I love time. you. Here we go. The number one movie for me is what character is this? He's yeah. from the movie. Our, he's our shark. Yes. You're going to need a bigger boat. Jaws. 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 Yeah. There you okay. Go. So Jaws is my first favorite movie of all time. Second favorite movie of all time. E.T. Mm. That was the movie that inspired me. I still listen yeah. to that soundtrack weekly. Whenever okay, I ride I a guess. bike, I, I, you know, my, my, <laughs> my imagination is going to, the bike's going to fly. I like love it. The part in E.T. Okay. Now I'm going to just spout out other movies that are my favorite of all time. We got Jaws. We got E.T. It's a Wonderful Life. Mm. Jimmy Stewart is one of my favorite. Here we go. A Few Good Men Ooh. teaches us about honor. You got the movie Braveheart, which teaches us about responsibility. Love it. Love that's it. it. There you go. I mean, I could keep going, but that's five. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Those five. are, you know, five movie recommendation guys. So check that out. Next, passenger or driver? Driver. Mountains or the beaches? The beach. All right. <laughs> so what are you afraid of? What am I afraid? Not having enough time with my wife and my kids i don't want to lose let me out. follow up a question um yeah you always you know whenever you're 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 answering giving an explanation you always connect it to family why, why is that why so family oriented <laughs> why is that so why yeah <laughs> well look you know my um i grew up in a home my parents were divorced and mm. um my parents were divorced and it was tough for me i was a toddler when they were divorced um, then my mom remarried this incredible guy who became my father, you know, mm. stepfather, but like a father. Um, and uh, but because of the pain I had growing up, I didn't speak to my biological father for over 15 years. Mm. As a matter of fact, when the movie Lion King came out, I remember because um, the whole scene when his father died, I remember thinking, like, whatever happened to my father? <laughs> he was just a, no, he was just estranged from us. We didn't talk for for over 15 years. Mm. And because of that pain that I went through, without realizing it, I had a goal that I wanted to be a father that showed up. I wanted to be a great father. Nice. And also, I remember just as a kid growing up, I, I just had my imagination, you know, when I would climb trees or build go-karts or clubhouses. Mm. Or, you know, I didn't have a lot of friends growing up. I lived in my imagination. <laughs> And I always love that feeling of that your imagination could take you away from anything and, and make you believe in yourself. When I climbed mm. a tree mm. and I was 50 feet tall in the air and these huge trees we had in our backyard, I felt like I was 50 feet tall. Mm. I felt like I was big. And I always, as a father and as a parent, my wife and I try to nurture our children to see their own potential. Right. There's really nothing been more meaningful in my life than being a father. And I, I just... And I know that someday these kids, these mm. four kids that we have, they're going to be out of the house mm. living their own lives. And look, they're living their own lives now. I have eight mm. till 17 years old. And but I just want them to, to I want to be part of nurturing them to find their unlimited potential. And by the way, I put that same, you know, feeling into the work that I do as a filmmaker. Mm. You know, I see the world's kids as my kids in a way. The films that I work on and write and direct. I have to believe in the values that I put in these. I have to believe that these can make an impact. Right. 
Um, so yeah, family really wow. is uh, very important to me. Powerful, powerful. <laughs> nice. I love that. I love that. Next. So, so, sorry, that wasn't a quick answer, but no, no, no. I love it. I love it. You know, it's it's a powerful context of your answers. Now I understand yeah. why. Next, your favorite color. What white. is your favorite color? I'm a minimalist. You can see in this room I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Everything is white. My wife some, sometimes says to me, honey, does everything have to be white? She says, you're going to love someday. If you're ever old and you're in a hospital, you're going to love it. It's all white. <laughs> I'm okay. like, yes. <laughs> Next, what is always inside your bag when you were a kid? Always inside my bag. Oh, easy. That was a paper and pencil, just drawing. Wow. wow. Always, always mm. drawing, creating. Right, right. And, and and scissors. I used to steal my parents' scissors because I used to make crafts out of cardboard. Man. And I could hear my mom going, Where are the scissors? Where are the scissors? I always had the scissors. I do the similar <laughs> thing. Because back then we don't have money to buy toys. What I do right. is I create, I, there, there's right. a shop where I go to that, you know, the back issues of, of Marvel and DC comics. So yeah. they allow you because it's open already. They allow people to read it. So what I do is I memorize it in, in my mind, how Superman wow. looks, how Batman looks. And then when I go home, of course I can't copy it like it is. <laughs> so I, I draw it and then I cut it. And that's my action figures. That's right. Cardboard, scissors, and tape was my favorite toys. I used to make cars and characters and houses, everything out of it. And wasn't it so much fun to create, Jen? Mm. Didn't you love that energy, that feeling when you were like in your own world yeah. and you were creating? And all of us should find a way mm. to create. You don't have to be an artist to create, you know? creativity is is a is a is a feeling we have when we create something out of nothing we should all find moments in our day to be creative that's when we by the way are very much like our creator mm. if you're if you're a religious person you want to be like the creator go and create yeah love that love i totally agree next question <laughs> this is a weird one <laughs> okay soap or toothbrush I wish my mom, my mom, I wish my wife was here to listen to that um, toothbrush because then you're interacting with people. It's nice to feel clean when you're low, but when you're talking to people, <laughs> if you're not going to be able to connect with people, if you smell like garlic in there, dude, it ain't going to happen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you All smell right. like anchovies, you're in trouble. <laughs> All right. Next. What is the weirdest food you ever tried? Oh, boy. I'll tell you the weirdest food I didn't try okay. about that. I was living uh, in South Korea, mm. working on uh, a project, and they took me out to eat one night, and they ordered some food, and in front of all of us was this metal bowl filled with water, and we're talking, and all of a sudden, tentacles shoot out of the bowl onto the table, and the bowl is moving around on the table. What is it, an octopus? It was many octopi. It was but, little octopuses in the in the bowl. And, and they, they're still uh, alive. Oh, they're alive. And the producer across the table grabs one of them, wraps it around his chopsticks. The thing, the tentacles are squirming around everywhere. He dips it in some sauce, puts it in his mouth, and can see that I'm freaking out. The tentacles shoot out of his mouth, and they're going all over his face and his nose. And then he bites down. And this little thing popped out of his mouth. I will never get onto the table. And he goes, oh, that's the brain. That's the best part. He grabs the brain with his chopsticks, dips it in. And he says to me, hey, you want the brain? It's the best part. And I go, <laughs> I I'm good. I'll stick with my bagel and cream cheese. So the weirdest wow. thing I didn't eat is an octopus. <laughs> wow. wow. Isn't that... You know, there's ink, there's black ink. How how's that? Well, they, they say culturally that there is a thrill uh, in eating it while it's alive. They say there's an extra flavor or some feeling they get, but you have to be careful because you have to chew the tentacles because yeah. they can yeah. stick to your 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 esophagus there. Yeah, that was a bad one. Uh, but for me, you know, I also grew up in a family where my dad, he would eat anything. And as kids, we would make this game, okay. Dad, eat this. He, we would mix foods together. He would eat anything. It was disgusting. Mm. He was my scientific experiment uh, growing up. But for me, I try <laughs> to keep my food a little simpler. 
No octopus. <laughs> no octopus. Me too. No octopus. All right. Last question. This could be, this could lead into something serious depending on how you will take the question. All right. If you have the power to bring back someone back from the dead, who would it be and why? Oh, wow. Well, that's it. That's an easy one. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, you know, this year, it is a serious one. This year, um, during the pandemic, we, a lot of people lost people close to them. And um, I, uh, I lost my cousin, Danny. Uh, he's just a year or two older than me, a couple years older than me. And he died unexpectedly. And he had a big influence on me growing up. He got me uh, interested in the music of Peter Gabriel. Many people know him. He's from the 90s, a big singer. And he bought me my first Peter Gabriel CD. I was 16 years old. And I'm like, who's Peter Gabriel? <laughs> I remember thinking, why would you give me a CD from this guy that I never even heard of before? Right. But then, you know, 35 years later, Peter Gabriel was one of my favorites. But I never told my cousin Danny how much that music influenced me. You know, Peter Gabriel has a song, Don't Give Up. If anyone's listening to this episode, check out that song. That song has saved people from jumping off bridges. It's, it's it, those dark moments of my day where I want to give up. I remember driving home from work after this failure and this failure. And I put on that song and it inspired me. And that CD that he gave me all those years ago really impacted my life. But I never told him. And this year, I remember waking up and going, you know what? I got to tell him just the impact that that music has had and the impact he's had on my life and how much I love him. And then it was too late and he died. And, you know, we can't bring people back. And I think the message I want to share with everyone is, you know, life is a blink of an eye and take today, take today. Cause we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know if we're even going to get tomorrow, but take today and make sure people who you love and appreciate, make sure you tell them how much you love and appreciate them. And if you have a person in your life that you have a, a problem with or you have an argument with, you haven't talked to them in two years, it's time to grow up, bury the hatchet and go forgive and tell people that you love them. It's important because we don't know what tomorrow brings. Love that. Love that. Man, thank you so much. Saul, you are such a blessing thank for you, your tips, for your stories, your values. Wow. Thank you so much for joining and, and being with us in the show. Bro, Thank I you. know you have a lot of events, projects, social media accounts, your podcast. Please promote. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, um, I started a podcast a little over a year ago called Life of Awesome. And uh, I came up with a name because simply, you know, I don't want a life that's good. You know, we don't want a life that's great. We want a life of awesome. And if somebody comes up to you and they say, how's your day going? You're like, yeah, it's okay. But what if they come up to you and go, how's your day going? You're like, my day? It's awesome. They'd be like, why? What happened? Did you win the lottery? D did you have a kid born today? What if you were like, no, no, just, it's just awesome. Every day that we are alive is a day to feel awe and to taste awesome. Check out the podcast. Some episodes are just me sharing ideas about relationships, parenting, marriage, personal growth achieving our own personal awesome and some of them are incredible guests that i bring on you know the very first guest i ever had on my podcast is the real rudy rudiger the real guy that played football at notre dame i had him tell his story it's unbelievable and i have disney people i had jody ben jody benson she does the singing and speaking voice of the little mermaid i had george foreman the boxer his story will blow you away so check out the podcast Life of Awesome. Check me out on Instagram. Come follow me on Instagram, Saul Blinkoff, and check out. I put quotes and clips and all kinds of things to hopefully inspire you through your day. And if you want to sign up on my email list, go to the website, saulblinkoff.com, and sign up and get a taste of awesome directly into your mailbox. Boom. Wow, guys. Please do connect with Saul. I'm sure he can help you in your journey towards success. Saul, thank you again so much. You are a blessing. Love you, man. Thank you for being with us here in the show. Guys, always remember, 
smile, have a positive outlook in mind, and God bless you.